Bonjour, bonjour, mes amis à Maroc. Malheureusement, il faut que je parle anglais. It's a pleasure to be with you again. And thanks very much to Jamal Belkadir for his terrific efforts in organizing meetings throughout my presidency <clears throat> and his time as regional chair and hereafter. Uh, he's done a terrific job in Maroc. So today I'm going to talk to you about evidence-based management of diabetic foot ulcers. Here are my disclosures. Now, it was Voltaire who wrote these words. And you can see, uh, nature does not cure the disease. Uh, in diabetes, it might do in other conditions. So we have to do better. We have to do better than this. When I first uh, joined Manchester Royal Infirmary as a consultant in diabetes in 1986, I came across this pleasant lady. And the art of clinical medicine is not only looking, but seeing. There's lots to see here. First of all, she can't focus because she can't see. She's blind as a consequence of diabetic retinopathy. She has a patch here for nitri nitrate delivery. She has a scar a previous uh, bypass, cardiac bypass, coronary artery. She's recently started peritoneal dialysis. This is uh, a long time ago. And she has no legs. And she's only in her 40s. This is what I call malignant diabetes. And she wanted her photograph taken to remind us that we have to do better. Uh, and I think at last, as I will show in this talk, I hope, that we are getting some evidence-based approaches to the diabetic foot, so this will become history. But we can't be complacent, because if you look, uh, as you know, in the first decade of this century, we saw a reduction in amputations across the world. But Ed Gregg, a well-known epidemiologist from uh, CDC in Atlanta, now working in London and Dublin, he reported just a few years ago that the reversal of the previous decrease in lower extremity amputations has stopped. It's been reversed. So the decrease has stopped. In fact, we're seeing an increase. Very worrying. And these are data we just published yesterday in JAMA. Diabetic foot ulcers in 2023, they're increasing worldwide. Globally, there are more than 6 million ulcers each year. Approximately 50% of these will become infected. Of those, one in five will be hospitalized. And one in five of those hospitalized will undergo some form of amputation. One amputation every 19 seconds in the world. These are depressing data. And I showed you the lady on dialysis. This is a paper we published much more recently. And that is following up just under 200 patients who were on dialysis as a consequence of end-stage diabetic nephropathy. Many of them had foot problems. The overall two-year mortality was over 50%. If the individual on dialysis had lost part of a foot or a below knee amputation or above knee, three out of four were dead in two years. We have to do better. The mortality is high, and this suggests that uh, perhaps if diabetes is the commonest cause of end-stage renal disease across the world, foot care on dialysis units where patients are sitting for four hours, three or four times a week, might be helpful. So in America, the pits means it ain't too good. But we can take the letters of what we should be doing, prevention of foot ulcers by identification of those at risk. And today I'll be talking about treatments and, of course, providing a service. Now, it's well recognized from prospective studies that a diabetic foot ulcer will heal if one, there is adequate arterial inflow, two, any infection is appropriately managed, and three, pressure is removed from the wound and its margins. We least good at this one, and we know that offloading in a cast that the patient needs to wear all the time reduces uh, recurrence, it actually leads to quicker healing. But I'm pleased to say 
in the last 10 years or so, there has been a renaissance in diabetic foot care. And recent guidance on the dis design of randomized controlled trials for putative new therapies are being observed. And there have been a number of well-designed randomized controlled trials published in the last five years or so. And these include uh, the Explorer, which is a, a sucrose octosulfate, Pronox, Leucopatch, and topical oxygen. Other studies are ongoing, and these might potentially challenge current standards of care. First of all, the Leucopatch system is now called 3C patch. Uh, and this is a well designed randomized controlled trial published in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. And this is the bedside centrifugation without any additional reagents that creates a disc of autologous leukocytes, platelets, and fibrin that is then applied to the ulcer. This study showed significantly better and faster healing in those treated with leukocyte, now leukopatch or other, now called 3C patch, than those who are on standard of care. As you see here, more rapid healing in the 20 weeks of follow-up after randomization. Next, there was the Explorer study, uh, which is a study using sucrose octosulfate in neuroischemic ulcers, a randomized controlled trial by my good friend and Mike Edmonds, who's been working as long as I have, or even longer, in the diabetic foot in the UK. This is the product that's better known, Ergostart, beyond uh, the La France Ergo company, a large multinational randomized controlled trial of sucrose octosulfate in neuroischemic ulcers. And they took ulcers which were primarily neuroischemic, <clears throat> superficial, or probing to tendon, but not with osteomyelitis. After 20 weeks, there was more rapid healing in the sucrose octosulfate or ergostart treated group than in the standard of care. There were no safety issues. And this is the first trial of any dressing that I know of uh, that has been shown to prove better healing in neuroischemic ulcers. The first proven medical therapy. So these are landmark studies. Some of you may have been uh, attending the last IDF Virtual Complications Congress in December of 2021. And that reminds me, look out, the next one is coming, it's December this year, the IDF is running again, a Virtual Complications Congress that will include one track on post-COVID and diabetes in disasters, such as wartime in Ukraine, in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, Palestine, sadly ongoing today, uh, and so on. So look out for that. But this was the last one, and I was asked to debate hyperbaric oxygen, myth or reality. Fortunately, I got the myth. That's an easier one to speak to. Having said that, there was a very good randomized control trial from our friends at Magnus Longdell and colleagues, multi-center in Sweden, published in Diabetes Care uh, just a few years, well, 13 years ago now. Placebo controlled, they had hyperbaric oxygen or hyperbaric air. But it was difficult to get into that study because you had to have really non healing neuroischemic or ischemic ulcers that had not responded to standard of care. And there was no possibility of revascularization. These randomized subjects underwent three treatments a week, up to 40 sessions, as I say, on hyperbaric oxygen or hyperbaric air. This is not the best uh, synonym for a study, hyperbaric oxygen and diabetic foot ulcers study. However, the complete healing was found in 52 versus 29% in the hyperbaric oxygen group, uh, and even more for those who had the maximum treatment of HBO, no major side effects. So suggesting that hyperbaric oxygen, despite the negative studies previous to this, might be helpful. Having said that, it was up to nine months before you saw the difference between the two groups. And this leads to some questions. So other groups tried to replicate this study. One group, uh, the, these studies were both negative, by the way. The first was from Dave Margolis in Philadelphia, epidemiologist. And the second was from a hyperbaric group or groups multi-center study in Canada. 
And both of them did not replicate those results. There was no difference. There was no difference between the two groups, hyperbaric oxygen or control. So then we thought our friends in the Netherlands, Holland, might give us the answer. They had the largest ever Damocles study. They planned to enroll 275 patients in a similar design to the one in Sweden. The results were slightly delayed, but they were negative, published in 2018. Another negative study. Hyperbaric oxygen did not significantly improve wound healing or limb salvage in ischemic foot wounds, but they did not get that number of patients. So there has been a question if it was underpowered. So we have three more negative studies. So I concluded in the debate, it was probably fiction, although we do have that one good study from Sweden showing efficacy. But then more recently, there has been the uh, development of topical oxygen studies or redevelopment, because there were some studies in the 80s, fact or fiction. And it appears that there is an evidence base for topical oxygen. Uh, and topical oxygen may be given in several ways by continuous delivery, as shown here, by low constant pressure, or most commonly by cyclical pressure. Uh, and this uh, can be done at home, which saves money over hyperbaric oxygen. And of course, you don't have to have the hyperbaric specialist in the chambers. And this is a chamber with topical oxygen, 10 to 50 millibars, on 90 minutes a day. And this gives compression to reduce edema and there's humidification as well. And here's a well-designed that fitted all the criteria for a well-designed trial uh, that I've discussed, the papers are suggesting how trials should be discovered earlier on. This is a large number of patients who were randomized to uh, topical wound oxygen or sham, uh, topical air that was. And those with topical wound oxygen were four times five more likely to heal than those on sham. In fact, they had a pre-planned interim analysis and the results were so good that they stopped the study. So they didn't need to enroll that number of patients. And it showed suggestion that the healing was not only healed, but it was maintained. Because 12 months after the study, 56% uh, of those on topical wound oxygen compared with 27% on sham remain healed. So here are data suggesting efficacy of topical oxygen. Here is the study, and you can see here by, this is by Bob Freiberg, uh, and again, Mike Edmonds involved in this. And here is a study showing the healing rate in the active versus the sham. And he maintained healing at 12 months. And the Kaplan-Meier curve is pretty convincing. Now, the Federal Drug Administration, FDA, is now demanding uh, that we have real-world evidence as well. And here's a real-world trial from the Veteran, Veterans Administration system in the United States. Now, this is not proof. This is supportive data. These are supportive data. So the endpoints here were hospitalization or amputation. Uh, and 7% of those who received topical wound oxygen at home versus 54% required hospitalization later on. And the amputation rate was also lower. But these are just supportive observations. They're not proof. Then we've had a number of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. This is a good one from Australia. And you can see here the benefit of topical oxygen. And this is the most recent one just published this year, again, supporting uh, topical oxygen over a placebo or a sham treatment as support. Now, all these new therapies uh, are to be found in this compendium. Now, I also work at the University of Miami. Uh, and Dr. David Armstrong, who's a professor of surgery in Los Angeles, who was my PhD student more than 25 years ago, uh, he and I co-chair the group that puts together these compendia. And this is the third edition. And you can download this free of charge. And this covers all these new evidence-based therapies, including uh, hyperbaric oxygen, um, topical oxygen, Fran Game talking about evidence-based therapy, the Luca patch, Mike Edmonds, but others, Augustart, and others talking about, for example, what's in the pipeline, the psychological approaches to this, and also negative pressure wound therapy, which is useful post-surgery. 
Each year, the American Diabetes Association publishes its standards of care. And these are the standards of care that were published in January of this year by the American Diabetes Association. And this is the subgroup, again, retinopathy, neuropathy, and foot care. As in that compendium, you can download these free of charge, these and the compendium, either on PubMed or through the ADA website. And the standard of care came up with therapies with randomized controlled trial evidence included, negative pressure wound therapy, certain biologics, the leuco patch or 3C patch, the autologous fibrin and leukocyte plate that patches, and for the first time, topical oxygen therapy. What about infection? Do we have any evidence for how to cope with that? Well, the um, Americans, Infectious Disease Society of America, IDSA, they still uh, suggest that we need clinical criteria to make a diagnosis of infection. And the clinical criteria are pretty simple. Odor, does it smell? Purulent discharge, cellulitis, swelling, hyperglycemia, pain, erythema, and pyrexia. Now, clinically looking at this, there's not much doubt that this wound is infected. And those of you who are vigilant and observant will see that this is a Charcot foot at the cuneiform metatarsal joint with a perilent discharge, probably due to a dropped cuboid bone uh, and pressure, repetitive pressure of walking on this, and the patient has lost the gift of pain because of neuropathy. And please remember that there are common abuses. What antibiotics are not? They're not growth promoters. They're not wound healing agents. They're not household cleaners. They're not hand cleaners and they're not scalpels. If this pus, let it out surgically. This is in the clinic. Patient with no sensation, a large abscess, let it out. Antibiotics treat infection. They don't treat foot ulcers. Here is a study now nearly a decade ago from our friends in Spain. This was a randomized controlled trial looking at local surgery or antibiotics, initially IV and then oral, for osteomyelitis. 37 patients in one Spanish center were randomized to 90 days of oral antibiotics or surgical therapy. They had a week's antibiotics, then surgical therapy. The median time to healing was the same in both groups. No differences in the numbers later requiring minor amputations, and therefore this suggested that antibiotics alone can be used in localized, usually four foot ulcers, in those with osteomyelitis, but not those that need uh, revascularization because of peripheral arterial disease or necros have necrosis. This is a very important trial published in 2019 in the New England Journal. This is a multi stenter study from bone infection units across the UK that came out of Oxford. This is called the Aviva study. Aviva stands for oral versus intravenous antibiotics. And this was oral versus intravenous antibiotics in osteomyelitis. And basically this showed no difference in treatment failure in either group, suggesting that oral antibiotics are just as good as intravenous for the management of osteomyelitis. Oral antibiotics, are much cheaper, they can be treated at home without the need for an IV nurse and a line in, which itself is a risk for infection. And these findings, I think, current, they, they challenge the current standards of care. And we need further studies, but don't think everybody needs intravenous antibiotics. It's not true. There's no evidence for that. So to conclude, although the diabetic foot ulcer incidence continues to increase, there have been major advances in the last five years. We're seeing randomized controlled trials and infections, as I've shown you, regarding, regarding uh, uh, guiding us on management. We've seen well-designed randomized controlled trials providing evidence of efficacious medical therapies. And I haven't had time to talk about this, but we're seeing a digital revolution of potentially home-based medical diabetic foot care which is smart technology, pressure sensing, tele uh, temperature sensing. I'll leave you with this quotation, Je pense de la France, Henri de Montville, who wrote in 1320, 
anyone who believes that anything can be suited to everyone is a great fool because medicine is practiced not only not on mankind but on the individual patient sitting in front of you so look at these guidelines look at the compendium but in the end it depends on what is needed for the patient sitting in front of you guidelines are guidelines not dictum they're not dictating what you should do they're suggestions what has evidence to treat the patient and you have to work out what is better for the patient sitting in front of you let's move forward to reduce amputations by getting good treatments but even better reducing the incidence of new foot ulcers merci bien